welcome uh, everybody to this panel discussion on the topic uh, modernizing indian agriculture through innovations and technology my name is abhishek gupta i lead caspian debt and i have been given the privilege and honor to introduce the panel members uh, today uh, fortunately for me i've had the privilege of working with each of them in various capacities uh, and i hope I, i'll do a good job of introducing them uh, we have with us today uh, mrs purnima khandelwal uh, she is the co-founder and ceo of ini farms uh, which is a company that is driven by the mission to transform the horticulture sector in india uh, purnima is uh, amongst the first women ceos of a large or probably one of the largest uh fresh fruit companies in india uh with the help of or along with ini farms uh purnima created india's first safe fruit uh, safe food brand uh, named kimai uh, and she looks after a, a, a wide range of functions within ini farms right from uh, brand building to consumer insights to distribution uh thanks for joining us purnima on this uh, panel uh, discussion Uh, Thank you, pleasure, Abhishek. Thank you. Uh, we also have with us uh, Ranjit, uh, Ranjit, Mr. Ranjit Mukundan. Uh, Ranjit is the co-founder and CEO of Stellabs Technologies, which is an end-to-end -end dairy supply chain technology solution company. Uh, Ranjit, along with his co-founders, started Stellabs with a mission to digitize the dairy supply chain and uh, make it more efficient. Uh, in a way when they started out together they uh, decided that they will apply concepts of sensors big data and technology uh, into the dairy supply chain to improve the efficiency and of course at the same time uh, positively impacting the lives of uh, millions of dairy farmers of india we also have with us mr arindam datta uh, he is the executive director rural and development banking at rabo bank uh and he is one of those people who has extensive experience in rural finance and agribusiness banking uh he leads several efforts across uh, rabo bank in the asia region uh amongst many of those things he also oversees rabo foundations projects uh, uh which typically involve uh combining innovations in technology and finance to support early stage uh, startups and innovations that lead to uh, better access to finance for small farmers in the agriculture sector uh thanks arindam for joining us my pleasure uh we also have with us uh, mr shubhadeep sanyal uh, he is the partner at omnivore uh, which is india's first uh, agritech focused venture capital firm i guess uh, they started investing in agtech before agtech was a word uh so from if from that perspective shubhadeep has been a part of this uh, whole uh, uh, change right from the beginning uh shubhadeep sits on multiple boards of the portfolio companies or investing companies of omnivore uh, he represents omnivore across multiple accelerators uh in the country he is also the formal liazo person for the government uh, related conversations that omnivore has is, has uh uh thanks so much shubhadi for joining us today pleasure thanks everybody uh lastly uh, but not the least the moderator of today's discussion uh, mr emmanuel murray uh emmanuel is a senior advisor at caspian uh he is the in house uh, guru as far as agri lending or rural lending is concerned uh he has more than 25 years of experience across uh, uh nabard and uh, manvia which is oiko credit india before joining caspian uh, five or six years ago uh, uh, emmanuel also uh, advises a lot of startups uh, in his personal capacity and along with the work that he does at caspian uh, emmanuel uh, over to you for the rest of the discussion uh, thanks so much abhishek it's a pleasure to be moderating this discussion on indian agriculture modernizing through innovation and technology so agriculture uh, is seen as having been slow in adopting innovations largely driven by the government uh, research and development and uh, there wasn't much happening till a few years ago when a large number of startups 
uh, came up taking interest in this space. As of today, uh, there are varying numbers, but uh, between some seven to 900 uh, agri startups are there on the ground. And close to 100, I suppose, have been funded uh, by various uh, uh, VCs and other investors. Uh, in, uh, professionals from other sectors like IT, uh, from uh, MNCs have entered into this space uh, and trying to address the challenges and maybe drag or pull uh, the sector which has lagged in terms of innovation and change compared to the other sectors in the economy. And that's what we're going to talk about today, that over these last five to six years, that uh, these startups have operated in this space, what difference have they made? And still what more is left to be done and what can be done? And what are the possibilities? And that I think is another area of interest. A large number of the participants are uh, young people who are looking for opportunities of what exists here. So I'll start right away uh, with Arindam. Uh, like me, he's been a veteran in this space. A large number of years in, we both were in NABARD, the start of our careers. And uh, later on, of course, Arindam, since you've seen Agri at such close range over this long period of time, uh, what do you think have been the uh, transformations that have happened? And do you see a lot of difference between agriculture at the times when you started working and as of today after the several uh, innovations and transformations that have occurred. Thanks, Mr. Murray. Uh, a very interesting question. When I started my career about 27, 28 years back and when I attended the first conferences, the problems which were stated in the agri sector, they remain exactly the same today. Mm -hmm. uh, the fragmentation, the inefficiencies, the smallholder problem, access to finance, access to good inputs, access to advisory, access to markets. At the gross level, yes, there's been a lot of improvement in terms of food security, in terms of India's diversification of crops, in terms of India's export. That has happened, but at a granular level, things have not changed. But I would say they have got more complicated today because we didn't have the water issue 30 years back. We have a water stress today and the biggest challenge we are facing today is the climate challenge huh? which we did not even know existed 30 years back so the problems which were there i would say remains today now coming to technology i would say that is the single biggest hope for india's agriculture because the sheer potential of technology, modern technology as it's available today, whether we talk of ML, AI, we talk of IoT, we talk of big data. Now, you know, agriculture is the perfect fit for these kind of data because of the sheer information asymmetry which is there in the market. Huh? And it's the in information asymmetry that prevents market players, whether they are smallholder farmers or they are businesses or they are banks from taking credible and consistent uh, kind of decisions, business decisions. Huh? The optimal decisions are not there because nobody has credible data as to what's being produced, where, what quality, what quantity, etc., etc. So it cuts down drastically on transaction cost. It cuts down on risk cost whether it's from a farmer's perspective or from an industry perspective. So data is going to be key. And uh, innovation and uh, uh, ag tech, I think, is going to be the biggest enabler for Indian agriculture to transform. I'm using a very strong word called transform, but we are seeing the transition process happen. And as you rightly mentioned, uh, it's enabled by three, four factors. One is, of course, the, the, the work that government has done around opening of bank accounts, the, the mobile penetration, uh, the, the cheap data uh, availability in our country, uh, and all that. But the strong human resources which has got into the sector, uh, you have the best of human resources from the best of B schools, from the best of technology institutions, people with decades of experience in the technology field. I mean, Ranjit is there in the panel. I mean, people like him, we didn't have such talent in the agriculture sector earlier. Second is 
the potential of technology per se. Huh? Mm-hmm. The, the, this kind of technology was not available earlier. So the key steps, firstly, will be digitization of farmers, digitization of land records, which remains a big challenge in the Indian market. That needs to be sorted out. And the government has a huge role to play there. And the third, and this is again very important, digitization of the entire farm cycle or the produce cycle. Now, once this digitization is done, it's still early days in the Indian market, I would say, in spite of all the headwinds headwinds that we have today because of COVID and other reasons. The good part is that it's private investment, which is uh, which is, you know, uh, transforming the sector. And it's not dependent on grants. It's not dependent on government subsidies. So, uh, you know, on the organizations like Omnivore and others, they are coming in with private capital to make a business case for technology. And that's the only way to go. So I would say I would be extremely bullish to build up resilient businesses in agriculture to uh, from, uh, you know, precision farming to precision credit. Mm. It's only through uh, through uh, technology that this is possible. It's happening uh, in in small pilots now. I would say uh, uh, the scale up needs to be done, and the important part is stakeholders need to start paying for those services. Right. I'll stop here for the time being, please. Right. right. So uh, we got to run it. I think uh, as Arindam had said, you know, a lot of manpower uh, professionals from other sectors have looked at agriculture and you're from uh, telecom space. Uh, What interested you in uh, agriculture? What brought you here? And uh, you were one of the pioneers in this space. And uh, why did you choose dairy as a sector, uh, which seems to be quite complicated uh, with most of the capacities in the cooperative space, uh, quite disaggregate? And how did you go about building technology and uh, uh, getting acceptance for the offering that you have? Yeah, <clears throat> so thanks, uh, Emmanuel, uh, for having me here um, and Avishek uh, for the introduction. Uh, so ours was a very typical in a case of, uh, you know, when all you have uh, is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you mm. know, kind of a concept, right? So all we knew was tech and we didn't know anything else at that point. Um, right, so we were like generally trying to explore, you know, how can you know we use uh, you know some tech that we have picked up over the years, um, and then see how to solve you know specific problems. Um, so uh, communications industry was uh, you know characterized by you know open networks, open protocols, app stores, cloud, AI, ML, high speed internet access. We're talking about five G, you know, right now. And they're typically the early adopters of anything new, um, you know, be it Apple, be it Microsoft, be it Skype. They're all you know, communications folks. They pick up uh, anything new uh, because it's a fairly mature industry from a tech intervention you know, point of view. Um, and Internet of Things was one such. Uh, when we were dabbling around with it way back in 2009-10, uh, it was more uh, you know, called as wireless uh, you know, M2M. And uh, we were at that point you know, stage of a career at that point uh, in 2010-11, we thought let's probably apply some of the uh, experience and uh, exposure that we had, you know, gained working for some of these good, uh, you know, corporate companies and communications in the communication space, the exposure that we've had to all this tech and sort of apply the hammer uh, to what looked like yet on the nail, right? And then um, we looked at uh, you know, all the high-end experience and the hands-on experience, you know, that we had, we looked at various sectors. Uh, we looked at agri, we looked at healthcare, we looked at many other sectors. And agri was extremely appealing uh, because um, extremely good problems existed. So for us, uh, from a problem-solving, uh, you know, perspective, um, it was extremely interesting. Uh, highly fragmented, barely touched by tech the way we knew it. Um, you know, good, uh, really good you know, uh, in a virgin territory for us to apply the tech into. Uh, in retrospect, I probably would have picked up much more simpler space, but we didn't realize all the challenges that existed in converting tech into business. But having to take a plunge, uh, you know, we just try to see how to make it work, 
you know, right now. But in retrospect, I would have probably picked something much simpler. Um, maybe like, you know, fix a food tech <laughs> ecosystem or fix a hail tech ecosystem. But then um, uh, folks like, um, you know, Subhadeep wouldn't let me do that, given that they wanted us to be, you know, full, fully ag tech. So we decided <laughs> now that we have taken a plunge, you know, let, let's fix it. Uh, this huge, you know, problem so solving, uh, you know, possibility. And then um, here we are, so trying to still solve the problem, still grappling, still trying to figure out things. Uh, we have digitized over 10 million liters of milk flow on an annualized basis on our platform. Uh, mm -hmm. We have over two and a half million farmers, but it's still a, it's still a you know, small drop in the ocean, it's still figuring out and hope to learn from all of you on the panel uh, and see how to, you know, take this to the next orbit. Uh, so Shubhadeep, uh what is it exactly that is interesting investors uh, to come into agri space? Uh, see, there are issues with, you know, uh, scale or growing uh, and then would farmers pay for all these technologies that are being developed? Uh, when are these going to be really uh, going really all India? Uh, are you going to be able to exit the investments you made? Uh, questions which are there, but in spite of that, uh, a lot of new investors are getting attracted to this space. And uh, what do you think is bringing them in? Sure, sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Emmanuel. Always, always interesting questions. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I think fundamentally, if I am to think about this this decade odd, which which is practically all I've done. So, I'm one of those characters who was born and brought up in in what we call agri tech. Um, I think there are two phases in which we could spare, you know, spread this out. One phase, which, which is when, you know, uh, like, like Ranjit was mentioning, they were basically start, you know, attacking a massive, massive problem, which they felt they could apply tech to. Um, and I guess at that point, there was tremendous dearth of capital uh, in terms of private capital, VCs, non-existent. There are a bunch of us trying to, you know, uh, learn something and, and kind of trying to follow conviction. Um, and, and most of the tech that we saw between 2010 and 15 or maybe 16 as well was largely B2B in nature, um, right? Uh, one can argue that's still maybe 70, 80% the case, but I think it had a very, you know, very B2B to F kind of an approach that listen direct to farmer is just an impossibility. Uh, we can't reach there. It's too much work for one small company to do. Um, and hence, we're working with enterprises, building for them, and then they have a layer with the farm. I think post-16, 2016-17, largely, of course, coupled with, you know, the internet highway, which got built, um, 4G, cheaper mobile devices, um, even demonetization, which kind of pushed behavior for, for even rural India to, you know, adopt digital payments. All of those factors and 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 the emergence of a certain number of large, um, I would say, startups in the non-agri-tech space. A Paytm became a Paytm. An Ola became an Ola, right? Uh, uh, an Oyo became an Oyo. I think that uh, that has really helped spur what we call agri-tech 2.0 or, or, or what's the current breed of, of agri-tech um, you know, entrepreneurs who are, who are even daring to think of a direct-to-farmer tech bridge, right? And I think that that uh, was was basically one of the major drivers or changes in which we saw capital beyond the impact world, right, or beyond impact investors, also sitting up and taking notice. Okay, now this is it's apparently a you know a market of thirteen crore farmer families who look pretty you know maybe not that uh, you know not, not the top one percent in terms of their Paymentability or whatever, but in togetherness, it's a massive, massive industry. It's a two fifty billion dollar industry. It will be three hundred fifty billion dollars. There can be a lot of exports. We can do so much in terms of quality improvement. So much in terms of leakages. The problem statement started becoming much more, um, I guess, visible. And I think credit also goes out to all people. Um, many of you are here, and all the entrepreneurs who basically, you know really slogged it out between 2010 and 15 and really got got the word out there that guys listen it it helps right we can change things there are there are small scalable uh, ventures that can be created which can grow big uh, adoption can happen so i guess that that confidence really was what i think a lot of the generalists 
which you see today um and and the last two years have been you know pretty crazy in terms of we have never really seen this kind of an interest in agri um mm. and i'm not complaining for one single second i'm very happy about it as as of now but um um i think we need more but uh, i think this is this is this is not one of those flash in the pan kind of moments that's what we'd like to believe um yeah. i mean we, we put out some work uh, a couple of weeks ago as well in terms of what we think a decadal shift in agri tech would look like to yeah, our yeah. 2030 report and and there also we are basically kind of talking about how this shift which which we all talked about today that how consumers and farmers will get more intimate over time using tech um right and and various other inefficiencies which we are talking about how these are going to be big problems and how much more capital than what there is today in india will be required and it's coming in um i think the number of investors today who have taken an agri bet would exceed 50 60 funds right um in isolation i mean with the nominee we have taken 25 bets so far but i think if you look at the totality more than half a billion dollars of just pe money has gone in and vc money has gone in uh, in the last few years in the sector so i think we are just beginning on exits emmanuel i think that is where we should hopefully see um, and i can see arindam smiling as well <laughs> there is that is i think something which we are all um you know hoping that the next 2 3 years um given how things have really ramped up in the last 18 months and um, covid has kind of been also like a like a major um push for the sector in terms of a positive push sure. where we're seeing adoption of of digitization happen really fast i think the next 2 3 years will we will have to see a few strong exits which will then fuel the next level of investor growth um that's kind of where we are working towards or we're hoping a lot of the companies which are there today will move thanks thanks so purnima coming to you in horticulture uh, where have you uh, deployed technology and then how has it uh, benefited farmers and in your own company uh, now that you're using qr code and other technologies for traceability uh how do you see that uh, significantly improving realizations or uh, helping you in doing things better uh, as a sector uh thank you manu i think uh, we are one of those uh, early birds in this space vidhi uh, so you were talking about those bunch of people who started this journey way back in 2009 10 so we are one yeah. of those uh, who decided to take a plunge in the agri sector way back in 2009 with our own thesis around an integrated uh, value chain approach right and what we realized was that you know when you're looking at uh, increased returns for the farmers it has to come through two things which is productivity and quality you know productivity over the last few years we've seen fmb production has uh, overtaken grains production in this country right um, right uh, the second order impact of that actually is that prices could go down you know when the production is higher the second order impact could be that the price realization goes down right. but what we realized was uh, very early in our journey was that you know it has to be more quality centric and that technology plays an extremely important role and uh, you know again when you're looking at quality there are two elements to it uh, and specifically if i were to just pick up fnb for a moment you creating on the field which is where quality gets determined now you know there are a host of package of practices which need to be implemented uh, there is implementation there is monitoring there is forecasting uh, you know uh, a weather forecast which determines what kind of pest disease infestation could happen and therefore you know what kind of preventive measures do you need to take so there are a host of things that you need to do from a technology standpoint on the field itself to get the right quality produce and the second element of that quality is to ensure that when your consumer sees that product it's still the same as was on the field you know and that's where again on the supply chain side there are a host of technological interventions that we've uh, personally done which is you know whether it's uh, temperature monitoring whether it's real time vehicle tracking because these in case of perishables they become extremely critical to ensure that the consumer sees the right product so two elements field and then eventually the entire supply chain which has to be managed well 
to ensure that the product reaches the consumer in the right uh, state and therefore a larger share of the consumer's wallet can go to the farm right so that's the kind of thesis that uh, you know we've had as an organization and i think it's paid well for us we've been able to enhance farming farmer income by you know 30% in case of banana uh, and about 40% in case of pomegranate just by ensuring that you know uh, things are done right both at the field and through the supply chain um and like i was mentioning technology you know we were we were um, pretty early in our days we went for something like an uh, sap system which in today's tech world is still you know an old age uh, technology adoption but that's mm-hmm. what we implemented pretty early you know couple of years uh, into our journey into the horticulture space because we realized that every single farmer brought on to a technology platform uh, every supervisor in our system has visibility on what price he can buy from a farmer uh, every single person who's selling has visibility on what price can he sell uh, so that's what we uh, you know implemented very early in our life um, qr code uh, emmanuel you spoke about now yeah. it has become a buzzword today you know everybody in the ag tech space talks about traceability Right. for us as an organization from the day we started traceability was a given of course the way of uh, managing that traceability traceability was to us in those days were was governed by two principles one was a need to have internal tracking right so in any right. case there's a problem that is faced anywhere in the world uh you know we were able to trace back as to where things went wrong you know was it at the farm level was it at the pack house was it during the during transit so that was a need the second was regulatory requirements so we were exporting mm-hmm. to europe and european markets don't accept produce without traceability so your traceability for us was uh, something which was hygiene from the day we started how was technology changed it? earlier you know every single box was carrying a traceability code today with technology we've moved to a level where we able to get every single fruit right. to carry a traceability code and that's the power of technology right so today how has it changed it's a different conversation that we are able to drive with our consumers today now i'm able to tell a consumer look this is where your fruit has been grown this is how it has been grown this is how it has traveled and to get all i can actually initiate a two way communication between a farmer and a consumer which is a great thing i mean a, a, a consumer being able to say thank you to a farmer i mean that's that's what uh, technology has helped us achieve so uh, for us all in all it's been uh, you know right from farm to supply chain and direct to consumer also now right right thanks so much yeah so all those who are uh, participating in this uh, please do send out questions we'll try and take some of them as we go along uh coming back to arindam uh, now you've seen uh, agriculture since rubber bank operates around the world and uh, it's an agri focused bank global bank uh, how do you compare agriculture development in countries like thailand or vietnam and others who are similar to india at some point and today are seen as leaders in this space and we look like laggards comparatively so what's your sense of uh, how uh, and why is it that uh, india hasn't been as quick as other countries in adopting technology well uh, i would slightly differ with that statement for the simple reason that yes while without modern digital technology some of these countries have done much better but so far as digital technology is concerned the kind of initiatives we are seeing in india we have not seen that in the other emerging parts of the world yes uh, so far as ag fintech is concerned parts of africa are pretty advanced but then the regulatory system there allows for all those innovations in that part of the world but in india so far as ag tech is concerned uh, it's far far more developed today than what we have in southeast asia and in the africa and it's going it's just a matter of time before indian tech players they move to other parts of the world 
for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we have a lot of European and U US technologies which are being deployed in Africa and in Southeast Asia to solve some of the problems. But these technologies are extremely expensive. If you look at the per acre per farmer cost, right. Indian technology by far is the most efficient, robust, and the cheapest. That's mm -hmm. because the entrepreneurs in India, they have realized that and they know upfront ab initio that it's a scale game, it's not a margin game. Huh? So uh, they have designed the technology in the way to make it uh, usable, profitable in the smallholder farm context. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would say that the next wave of technology change is going to come from India. India is definitely going to be the hub for the sheer size of, you know, uh, the resourceful human resources that we have. Mm -hmm. And second is the kind of problem statement that is there in India is not there anywhere. So mm -hmm. whatever succeeds in India, I'm pretty confident would succeed in a lot of these other countries. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And agriculture is very cultural context. So we'll also have to see as to what is successful in one part of the world, whether it can be translated in the other part, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's especially the upstream part of agriculture is rooted in the local culture. Hmm? Right. That has its own implications. Right. So, uh, Ranjit, the uh, uh, pay I understand, is a technology that you have developed uh, to speeden up payments to the farmers and to kind of do assessment of uh, farmers' creditworthiness and in other ways make them access to other services. So what's been your experience with that and uh, where do you see this kind of a product being used for alternate evaluation for the purpose of credit assessment by banks and others? Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, you know, for us, uh, the foray into uh, a component like Mupe uh, was a result of the fact that we were getting a lot of data across the dairy supply chain, right? So it was almost like we uh, you know, built a, a digital highway right through to the dairy supply chain, getting very vertically, uh, deeply integrated. And then we started getting a lot of data and uh, we figured that uh, this data could be useful uh, for financial institutes, NDFCs, banks, small finance banks, could be useful uh, you know, for insurance uh, you know, companies to provide you know, micro insurance, uh, it could be useful for cattle nutrition companies, could be useful for uh, cattle pharmaceutical uh, you know, companies. And, and this digital highway could be used by the entire ecosystem to further drive up the three key pillars that we always you know, look to, uh, you know, uh, look towards productivity, quality, and traceability, right? And one of the key things we realized was that to drive up the, um, uh, the uh, 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 productivity levels at a smallholder dairy farm, uh, you also need to increase the herd size. It might be a day one could be two animals, three animals, but over time can it become four animals, five animals, mm -hmm. um, you know, 10 animal you know, types. And for this, we figured that capital adequacy is quite important. And, um, and farmers were not necessarily the best of segments that financial institutes, uh, institutions like to, um, you know, lend to, because by its very nature, it's risky. How do you recover a small ticket loan money? All right, uh, SHG kind of lending used to happen, MFI and SHG type of lending, but not direct, you know, retail, you know, type of uh, you know, lending. And then we figured that it's pretty important to enable credit for such, uh, you know, farmers so that they can increase their herd size. Their, even with a half an acre land, how do you increase your herd size? How do you increase various credit products for these, uh, you know, farmers? It could be a credit product to uh, buy an additional cattle. It could be a credit product to buy extra nutrition uh, for the cattle because cattle nutrition is critical for you to improve the productivity. And we figured that, you know, building an alternate credit score is a very compelling thing in this space with all the data that we're getting. So we got, we got started down this path. Uh, we had, uh, you know, partners like Equifax help us, you know, build out, uh, you know, the score. And, uh, and based on the score, we started getting into um, a joint risk underwriting uh, with our credit partners. These are small finance bank. These are NBFCs. These are um, MFIs. These are regional, you know, players uh, who did not have access to data-led lending, right? And now with this, uh, we call this Moose Score internally. That's the score we use. It's again a very typical 
CB score goes from 300 to 900. Uh, and then we see who's a more credit worthy farmer, uh, which farmer needs what type of a product. Uh, it's a function of the farmer's cash flow. And very importantly, since all of the farmer payments flow through us, uh, we're also able to enable a digital recovery of credit. Uh, which gives a lot of confidence to the financial institutes to say, okay, how do they don't need to run behind the farmer every single day. And also some pretty interesting risk models built in, a risk, as a risk a monitoring model, such as we get to see the farmer every single day, twice a day throughout the year. Yeah. Because milk is a single SKU product, flows throughout the year. Um, animals continue to produce milk throughout the year. Uh, so we get to see the farmer every single day, right? Every single day, twice a day. And if there is a default, if there is a uh, you know sudden disappearance of the farmer for a given day, we get to turn up in front of the farmer through a phone call or physically the very same day or the next day. It's not yeah. going to work like a typical MFI loan where you get to see that the default has happened when that particular month's payment doesn't happen. Uh, it's sort of a daily monitoring that happens. And using this mechanism uh, and, and a touch wood, uh, hopefully continue this way that we had zero NPAs even during COVID. Right? There were some delays, but given that as long as animals produce milk, you know, be it this lockdown or no lockdown, COVID or no COVID, animals continue to produce milk. And as long as animals produce you know, continue to produce milk, uh, you know, we uh, we get to monitor this on a daily basis, right? And and further, Musco tells us. Uh, you know, what kind of a product do we need to go give out? How many would be covered in this? How many so farmers right are covered? Now, yeah, so right now, uh, we just started it about eight months ago. So we have disbursed about uh, 300K USD, uh, you know, worth of loans on our you know, platform. These include small ticket loans like cat nutrition loans, 5,000 bucks for three months. This includes big ticket loans like 70,000 bucks for a cattle living insurance. And we all, always ensure that uh, the, the credit that is given out is used uh, for that particular input service. It cannot be like a general purpose consumption loan. Um, right? So, uh, so, uh, curious question is how, what is the cost of servicing this if you are facilitating and helping yeah, recovery? No, yeah, so that's a, a really interesting question because we have ops team on the ground. So we have teams like a farm intervention team. We have teams like tech intervention teams. So we have a whole army of people um, on our, on our um, some of them not on our roles. These are people who we Uberize and on, on board on our platform. And, but then top of the pyramid, you have people in, on our roles. So what we try to do is we sort of cross sell, cross skill, upskill these teams so that we don't have to roll out these uh, same teams. For example, a collection center is an interesting intersection point, right? A collection center where we run and operate the collection center. Farmers come into the collection center every single day, twice a day. So it's a, a case of an extension coming into the collection center rather than, rather than uh, an extension going into the farm. Chasing it, yeah. Right, so it's typically the extension, the notion is it has to go to the farm, but here you have a case of uh, the extension walking into the, a farmer walking into the extension rather than an extension walking into the farm, right? Um, and, and all the banks that we worked with have uh, been extremely encouraging. It was uh, pleasantly surprising that they were willing to develop composite credit scores, right? So they have their own CB checks that they do with the various credit bureaus. And then we have our own in credit score. So the idea is to develop, um, we're developing a composite score. It's not like our score is better than what exists, right? But do remember that more than 60% of the farmers are NTC, new to credit. They don't have any prior, you know, CV scores, right? And secondly, the fact that they have defaulted on a MFI loan three years ago does not make them a bad farmer today, right? right? Um, so we know based on the milk pouring pattern, we know based on the vaccination protocol adherence, we know based on their various other deworming protocol advice and they're, they're quite psychometrically progressive, right? So uh, we should not use one broad brush to say all farmers with a CB default three years ago is a bad farmer today, right? So that's what we do differently. We look at the score and say, hey, look, what has been his footfall in the last 180 days? What has been his footfall in the last 365 days? How has the milk uh, composition improved, right? A milk composition improving is an indication of the fact that he's taking good care of the animal nutrition. Right? How can you use that to tell him that he's a better you know, sort of a farmer? And quite interesting, when we did a cross-check between this typical CB score, CB score and RCB score, uh, it was throwing up similar results. Right? Whom we assessed it to be bad, the CB score also assessed them to be bad. Whom we assessed it to be good, 
they, they CB score also has them to be good, right? But mm -hmm. our score existed for people without CB scores as well. Right. Um, so the idea is that uh, the notion of a composite score is something that a lot of the banks are signing up. We have actually signed up ourselves as a, a credit DC partner of various banks and a good confidence among the banks, we, but we just need to prove it out for a longer duration. It's been pretty new. It's like eight to 10 months old. Right, three hundred thousand dollars worth of loans that has been disbursed, and we think yeah. uh, we think it can scale faster. Yeah. So, uh, Purnima, coming back to you, uh, this lockdown, which was suddenly announced, and uh, there was no time for people to prepare, and then uh, handling a perishable commodity like yours, and having export commitments with all the logistics all uh, shut down. How were you able to manage and what impact did it have? How did you turn around and uh, set things back on track? I uh, would love to hear a bit of that experience. Yeah. Uh, so Emmanuel, uh, when the lockdown happened, uh, we were right in the peak of our season. Uh, you know, our uh, export season actually is uh, largely between uh, January and May. And yeah happened in uh, March, uh, you know, we were right right there in terms of both uh, production um, on the field and in terms of the volumes that we were moving as an organization. So it hit us quite bad uh, initially. Uh, you know, the good thing was that yeah. we have a lot of outsourced labor which travels from Ulisa and uh, Bengal. So when the lockdown happened, they were all in those specific locations. So that was the good part. Um, there were massive disruptions. In fact, for a couple of days, we have a bad also signal, shut. Yeah. Sorry. A uh, couple of days, port was also shut. You did not have, uh, you know, drivers to carry trailers from the port uh, to the warehouse. Uh, there was a lot of fruit on the fields uh, with farmers not being able to harvest because the movements were restricted. So while we had labor on the ground to actually assist farmers with the harvest, we actually could not uh, ensure movement of produce. So um, initially tough days, I think uh, reached out to a lot of uh, administrative, uh, you know, uh, set up uh, both at the district level, state and the central level to just mobilize things on the ground. Because, uh, you know, vehicle movement was severely restricted and no drivers. I mean, practically there were no drivers to carry the uh, vehicles and move the uh, produce. So that's, that's where we were. Uh, a lot of produce at the farm level not harvested. So farmer distress was, was there initially. Two implications of that. No realization for the crop that was there. And uh, skepticism on what needs to be done for the next harvest. Right? So that was that was a big struggle for us. Uh, you know, trying to tell them that you know there's a temporary and uh, they need to take it in their stride. Mm. Uh, that's where we were. We had to change our business model a little bit. Uh, typically, we have our own set of people going to a farmer's field, uh, looking at uh, what grades of food is available, harvesting, and then bringing it to the pack house. We had to change the model a little bit where we asked the farmers to harvest because it was much easier for them to get uh, things organized locally. We just organized vehicles for them, got their produce into our pack house, sorted, graded, and then sold. So, um, you know, that's that's how it was. Uh, I think getting people uh, mm -hmm. to work was the other big challenge that we faced. It was just so much of uncertainty, fear in the minds of people that, you know, just getting our own supervisors to move between villages uh, was a challenge. So those those were the things that we grappled with. Uh, I think we just had to take a point of view that it is, it is farmer first, it is customer first, uh, and it is people first. So just got our employees to have that kind of an outlook to manage the whole situation. Uh, a lot of things move digitally, uh, you know, all the, you know, it's, it's actually incredibly surprising uh, how tech savvy farmers are today. You know, we were able to drive all our communication through Zoom, Google Meet, Microsoft Teams, uh, you know, where we were telling farmers what needs to be done, how things need to be mobilized. So uh, technology again helped uh, just in terms of getting the communication, 
with the broader uh, teams and organizations in place. Um, logistics, uh, you know, continues to be a challenge. Uh, freight rates went up by 6x at a point in time. And we had fixed price uh, contracts at the other end, uh, which are around the year. We, we tried to service as much as we could. So uh, those were the initial things that we kind of faced. But I think um, things have, you know, kind of stabilized a lot more now. Uh, there's a lot, uh, there's uncertainty still in this, especially in the state of Maharashtra. You know, every other day there is some district or the other, especially Pune, Sholapur, uh, you know, reasonable spike even now. So those are districts uh, which are still bothering us a little bit. But I think, uh, you know, we've, we've evolved our own model and devised our own new normal uh, around uh, getting things around. So right, right. thanks, thanks. A lot. Looked at it. So yeah. Shubhadeep, uh, coming back to you, uh, a large amount of the investments have happened in the downstream side. And the upstream hasn't attracted uh, that great an investment. So uh, in your sense, again, looking at your own vision document, which says that almost every farmer you will be using technology, uh, which means money has to flow into or all these solutions have to reach out to the farmers. So how do you see that uh, happening? And uh, why do you think that area hasn't got the kind of attention that the downstream in terms of money? Uh, so far. And also there was a question I think you could also answer what kind of returns uh, <laughs> should an investor expect if he's putting money into ag tech, an audience oh, question. Oh, let, let, me, let me try my best. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll go for the first one, um, the easier one. Um, so <laughs> I, think, I think fundamentally the reason why, why we think a lot of the, and we call them kind of market linkage or kind of supply chain, value chain uh, investments, right? Which have gone in first. Um, I think it's the more, um, so what, you know, fundamentally, whenever we think about Indian Ag, we always used to stress on productivity, productivity, productivity on farm. Mm. Right? And I think the, the losses which post-production uh, our farmers were bearing, and, and you could always hear about reports of excesses, being dumped and not sold and this and that. I think that really piqued the investor's interest that, okay, if X is being produced, why not first figure out a way to at least ensure that that X gets sold in the most optimal manner, in the most efficient manner, you derive more value from that X is whatever is produced. And then you can come and tackle the inefficiency which exists before you get to a crop output phase. Um, now, now, also we have to understand that a lot of the the government-related spending uh, in in agri, which is which is not a small amount, I think the entire R and D focus of all our ICR institutions and everyone else has been very much on the upstream side, right? It has been on varietal improvements. It has been on how do you tackle uh, biotic and abiotic stresses um, at a at a at a germplasm level at others. There have been a couple of kind of breakthrough industries. Uh, over the last couple of decades, right? When we look at micro irrigation, for that matter, um, the amount of support in terms of subsidies that sector is required to be where it is today. And nowadays, you will find many pockets where farmers just need it. And this goes back to, I think, the point Arindam was mentioning that climate risk uh, is one of those challenges which I think will change how tech adoption happens in the next decade, as opposed to a much more... Um, historical uh, outlook. Right. So I think one is that, yes, it seemed to be the more obvious choice that let's stop spoilage. Let's, you know, at least ensure the remuneration or the, or the inefficiency in the chain goes away first. Right. And it seemed like a massive, massive opportunity where you could actually put down infrastructure, collection centers, distribution centers, right. Where, where you see money being rotated very easily. I think the next wave, um, we will see enough um, investments also in upstream. Dollar to dollar, I don't think they will match uh, because I think upstream won't really need that much capital also, to be honest. Uh, farmers are extremely smart um, businessmen, businesswomen. So they will understand, um, you know, when they're investing in their business, they understand the concept of returns really well, uh, sometimes better than, you know, we do. So, so they will not, uh, you know, invest in something if they don't see a certain return being made. And in the case they do, 
I think you can ask anyone who's working on the upstream side tech um, uh, piece. I mean, case in point, you know, of course, Ranjit has a lot of experience with dairy, but in 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 horticulture, for example, Fasal, which is one of our one of, one of our companies which works with farmers, giving them field level advisory, disease incidents, pest um, incidents, and of course, automate their irrigation. Uh, we never thought that individual farmers would really pay for hardware or subscription, right? Mm-hmm. Farmers are happy paying 700 rupees uh, a month or 800 rupees a month and paying for the device and all the, all, all the, you know, kind of the tech software product which comes with it um, because they see a definite value there. So I think more investments there will follow. Um, I think a lot is linked to, um, you know, the, the creation of, of these digital parcels uh, whether it is land records being digitized, whether it's a um, lot more fintech solutions being available for farmers, I think they will be extremely critical to also help farmers adopt that. Okay, I mean now it's happening for inputs, right? With with AgroStar and with a bunch of B2B players as well, um, and and of course uh, like a Dehat or anyone, access to inputs is being driven, um, you know, through digital kind of means, through through tech means. And, and that is something which is upstream and we'll see more investments. But yes, I, I agree with you that it, it, it won't match dollar to dollar uh, in, the, in the short run. I think one area uh, we see, especially for the, for the coming future where, where we need to have more investments, I don't know when, when we'll see it, is the whole area of, uh, of agri-biotech specifically. We don't really see startups in India which are working on um, slightly longer uh, research-driven projects using biotech, right? right? And that that is going to be extremely important as we have more and more weather stresses, more and more um, kind of abiotic stresses in ag. Um, so that's kind of you know what what do you think about space? Uh, what about returns? Oh yes, so much uh, <laughs> putting money. So I think for returns, it's different for different people. Um, there is there is definitely everyone who's operating here mostly uh, today. Everyone has the fiduciary responsibility of you know, returning money back to their LPs, limited partners, investors. So um, while there might be, uh, we might be more patient, I think anyone who is investing in agri definitely has to take a slightly long-term view. This is not a sector where you can probably see an exit in three, four years time, right? Um, the seasonal business, it will take eight years, 10 years. So you have to have a long-term view. And I think a percentage is very difficult to put uh, that way, right? I mean, we have a hurdle rate of, let's say, whatever, you know, 12% where yeah. we return capital back to our investors. Uh, if our hurdle rate was lower, our expectation would have been lower. Uh, so, so I think every investor out there is trying to maximize returns. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the fallacy was 10 years ago or 8 years ago, uh, this whole, you know, VC and agriculture kind of, you know, were in opposite directions. People thought impact money is money which kind of is going down the drain. Um, whereas that's not the case today. Even the larger global impact world has basically said that, listen, it has to be sustainable. It can't be that, you know, grants are grants, right? They, they serve a very important specific purpose. Let's not confuse that with investable uh, impact capital, right? Sure. So, so um, yeah, I, I, would, I would argue that it is muted. Uh, you know, it's, it's not... No one in agri has, uh, you know, understands, everyone understands that you won't see three-year returns like you can see in a, in a B2B enterprise kind of environment, right? Or in an edtech kind of environment of late, like we're seeing. Crazy valuations don't really exist. Um, so, so I guess returns will also be adjusted accordingly. Uh, so, Arindam, there, there was a question uh, about data. So, there's a lot of talk about uh, data being uh, transformative in agriculture. So someone's asking what exactly is the kind of data and how would a farmer use this data? How would you make it into a usable form that is relevant to a smallholder farmer? A very good question. Now data has many implications. Data has implications from the not only the usability perspective, but from a data protection perspective, there are a lot of issues which still needs to be solved in the Indian market. We don't have a, you know, a full act stack in India. Huh? That also a lot of works there. Now, from a farmer's perspective, uh, now what makes a farmer adopt technology? Let's take the example of what uh, Subhadip mentioned, say uh, AgroStar app, huh? which is mm-hmm. like a Facebook 
uh, and an Amazon for a farmer. Amazon can buy whatever he wants and he can share pictures and, uh, you know, it becomes a community of farmers. But there's a commercial kind of a transaction which happens there. Now, why does a farmer use it? So the farmer needs a to uh, to be educated through whatever means. I mean, different companies are way, uh, using different kind of means to reach out to the farmer. Is that the app makes sense to them? Second is it's giving them information which is very, very precise and which is exactly what the farmer wants. That's very, very important. It's, 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 it, it, it just won't work if you bombard the farmer with, with information which is irrelevant. It has to be relevant to the business. And the second issue with uh, usability of data or you know, these platforms or apps is they need to be as comprehensive as possible. A farmer simply cannot you know, use 10 different mm -hmm. apps for Absolutely. 10 different kinds of services. But Correct. then it's a chicken and egg story. We can't even expect a new you know, tech company to be able to provide a full stack solution to the farmers. So the key message out there is to understand what a farmer needs and something which Ranjit also mentioned is we need not only tech, which could be high tech, medium tech, but we need a high touch at this point of time in India that a high touch and high tech or medium tech solution needs to work hand in hand so that there's a presence on the ground to be able to educate and increase the awareness at the farm level. Thank you. So uh, Ranjit, there was a question about Who's going to pay for all this technology? So for example, you've developed this technology for uh, dairy. So how much cost have you added to every liter of milk by someone who's going to take your technology and uh, who's going to pay for it? Yeah, so the idea is one of our uh, approach has been to provide you know, premium market you know, linkages, right? Yeah. So if you look at, um, there are 300 million households in India, about 30 million of them, contribute to 65% of the FMCG value, right? So how do you enable that market linkage so that um, any any component of quality or any component of traceability uh, that people are willing to pay for it, right? If people are willing to pay for antibiotic free stuff, people are willing to pay for pesticide free stuff. How do you sort of ensure that for uh, the consumers are willing to pay for, you know, in a better quality, better traceability, better health, better immunity, right? And then the rest of the supply chain, you know, pays for itself. Our direct quote market has always been, um, has always been a B2B-ish nature. And I like the term B2B2F, where, uh, right, the direct go to market is B2B, but, you know, the farmers wouldn't pay for all of this directly, right? So they, they'll think that, they give credit to the cow to give better quality milk. They wouldn't credit the technology involved, right? They wouldn't pay for the pedometer that we put on the cow's leg. They'd say, my cow is giving better milk, so you, you pay for it. Why should I pay for the pedometer? They would pay for simple services like artificial insemination. They'd pay for cattle nutrition, but they wouldn't pay for the more obvious, the cow is giving better milk. They wouldn't attribute it to the tech that is being there. So we need to figure mm -hmm. out the best way to make this pay is to ensure that the consumer pays you know, better. If you're able to assure that you're giving consumers better quality, higher traceability, um, you know, milk with better omega-3 fatty acid rich, milk that is very low in bacterial load, they would you know, tend to pay more for it. So there would always be a, 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 a place for commodity milk, but there would always be a place for um, the premium milk in as well. Right? 30 million households would pay premium. 270 million would pay you know, for commodity. It's like the same in economy sure. business class in you know, a component. And for us, the fixed and the variable cost to cater to both is the same, right? right. So there will be lost leaders uh, in, in our segment, and but there will be places where you get higher premium. We just need to make that work in a combination. Right. right. So Purnima, uh, talking about uh, asset light businesses versus businesses that invest into creation of assets, someone like yours requires, I think, a large lot more of capital and uh, fixed assets. So how do you compare these two and, you know, most uh, agri techs want to do things in the, in the lab or sitting somewhere and then want to take it to a million farmers uh, without really creating too many assets. Is that a workable solution or uh, how do you solve that? So in our case, uh, Emmanuel, uh, you know, infrastructure needs to be on the ground, right? So whichever cluster we work in, we need to create some kind of a setup. Now, what we've done is that 
you know, to solve this problem of uh, carrying too much of asset on our books, what we've done is that we work with mobile infrastructure, for example, at the field level itself. So it's an infrastructure that moves between one farmer's field and then, you know, it can be carried to the uh, second farmer's field. So, you know, avoid as much of fixed infrastructure uh, uh, as possible. The second is, uh, you know, we, we own a very large infrastructure ahead of Pune, which is our nerve center where all the produce comes in, gets sorted, graded, packed, and then moves out. Um, when we moved to Andhra, we realized that, in fact, there are a lot of people who are willing to invest into infrastructure. So what we did was we, we signed up operating leases with them just to ensure that, you know, we're not carrying too much of uh, asset on our books and not making too much of investment on fixed infrastructure. So that's, that's the kind of model we've adopted. On technology side, actually, uh, a lot of the solutions that we are looking at uh, you know, while uh, they are more uh, adapted to what the requirements are, so a lot of uh, a lot of the solutions are off the shelf products that we've picked up. But the whole idea is to get actually a lot more deeper and invest a lot more into building these solutions, which are more customized to the requirements of our business. You know, so that's what we are looking at the overall investment into infrastructure and technology. Right. So we are close to five o'clock and I think we'll go around the panel once uh, if they can give some guidance. There are over, let's say, a thousand startups in agriculture and it looks like a fraction of them would actually get funded and scalable. So uh, what is your advice to those, you know, they're spending a few years of their life uh, trying to find a solution and then... Uh, uh, they shouldn't get discouraged. So how do you, what kind of advice do you give them on how they should go about uh, uh, scaling up, attracting capital, uh, reaching large number of farmers and really being successful? So starting with Arindam, uh, since you have to leave for another call soon, uh, what's your message to those large number of startups who keep knocking on our doors and then have ideas, but uh, they're still too premature? I, I, I would have two suggestions. Uh, one, the first suggestion is go for co-creation. Do not try to think that I'll create a solution and then sell it to supply chains of the banks. It doesn't work like that. Many of the entrepreneurs are not from the ag sector. They do not understand the intricacies of how decisions are made by different businesses, whether a bank or a supply chain player. So go with uh, a proposition where you suggest co-creation of solution. That will be much more acceptable to a corporate, for the example of Mupe that Ranjit mentioned out. Now that needs to be developed and refined with a financial services sector, a, a provider of capital so that, you know, different financial institutions have different credit requirements, different kind of uh, due diligence requirements. So that will need to be adopted. Don't go with a solution that fits all. That's one. And second is, Working capital, especially for active companies, is extremely important. Um, investors love asset-like companies, tech investors, but bankers like asset-heavy companies to provide working capital. And that's, that's a critical piece. But we have institutions, one is Caspian itself, who are providing working capital because I've seen the death of a lot of active companies because they do not have access to working capital. Understand how to approach the and solve the working capital problem and what is it that makes you working capital ready it's very important to learn this very early in your life cycle so i think a good point that arinda made and i should go straight to purnima how important was let's say debt from caspian in your business Oh, uh, the, Emmanuel, you've uh, touched the uh, absolutely the right chord. So, uh, you know, and like Arindam was saying, uh, entrepreneurs need to understand that working capital is a challenge in this sector and that it needs to be managed. And, uh, it's been a very, very long relationship with Caspian for us to thick and thin of things, uh, you know, given that uh, it's not a business which is cash positive as you start. There are no uh, banks who are willing to look at you and uh, finance you. So uh, both for our working capital requirements and the infrastructure that was that I was earlier referring to. In fact, the entire the infrastructure 
uh, on the debt side was funded by Caspian. So I can't thank Caspian enough for uh, the important and the, uh, you know, it, it, they played a very, very important role in our journey um, and the success so far. Thank you. So Ranjit, uh, carrying on on that same a message to uh, entrepreneurs, you know, who are struggling to grow and attract capital. Uh, what's your message? Uh, is it patience or uh, is it the model that they have? Uh, what exactly do you think they should focus on? Uh, is it worth giving away a career in, uh, in the US or somewhere and coming back and uh, not being able to find your feet over here? Yeah, so I, I don't think there's one, uh, you know, secret sauce, as I think all of us on this you know, panel would have realized what works for one doesn't you know, work for the other. But I think it, it's a extremely, um, you know, close to almost being a titillating experience for having, you know, tried to go into the hinterlands and, you know, solve the problems. So I think if, um, if there is a, a you know, problem solving nerve that you want to touch, I think you should definitely give it a try. As they say, most often you regret what you did not do. Uh, you don't regret what you did. So I think you should give it a plunge. And I think a few things come to my mind in, in different dimensions were touched upon by my, my, by my other panelists. One, it, you know, don't get all consummated by tech itself. Tech can only be an enabler. It's sort of a, uh, it's sort of an enabler to an end goal, right? So just use it as a VV. We were so enamored by the tech part, we thought it can do everything, but then we realized it's a small cog in the wheel. Point, Take an yeah. ecosystem approach because it's a massive problem. Uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, just see if we can do, uh, just on this call, I've just dropped a mail to Purnima to see if we can collaborate. So just build ecosystems, uh, build uh, collaborations and see if uh, we are able to you know, step up you know, very quickly. Uh, take a supply chain approach, uh, learn from Amazon, what Amazon has done. They've taken a very, very end-to-end -end supply chain approach, um, which we didn't realize. I wish we had realized this you know, day one. Uh, there is a you know play for vertically integrated approach as well as a horizontal tech component. The horizontal tech layer that you built out has a good international uh, play to it as well. So we have a small subsidiary in France. Some of the tech component that we did in India, we're trying to see if this can be replicated uh, in, in the Europe, right? Um, so uh, Europe has a much better appetite for paying you for SaaS revenue, paying it for the tech part. Whereas India plays for something which is slightly more physical in nature. Right, so a vertically integrated approach in India, whereas a horizontal approach internationally sort of helps. So these are some of the things that come to my mind, but different shades of it work for different people. So uh, Subhadeep, uh, again, you know, the question of uh, corporates uh, not showing adequate interest in Actex has been mentioned in quite a few reports. So these are solutions that are relevant, appropriate, or they may benefit most from these but uh, they haven't been uh, giving too much of attention to the solutions that Actex are offering. And then uh, a question related to that is, uh, how do you see exits? Uh, what route will uh, exits happen in this sector? Sure. Um, I think I think the question is the answer for the other. Um, in terms of in terms of corporates, I would agree that um, they're still, I think, in their learning testing phase. Um, if, if we look at India, we still have some of the, you know, corporates like um, Syngenta actively engaging with, um, let's say, let's say the ag tech ecosystem. We have Mahindra, which has actively done some investments. It's made some acquisitions, one of them from our, our portfolio as well, uh, which leads to an exit, uh, you know. Um, so it's, it's in its early days. I think if you look at globally, if you look at the ag majors, Every single one of them either has acquired companies, um, tech companies, agri-tech companies. There was one wave of acquisitions which happened in 2010 to 12 between the climate and granular, um, a couple of robotics companies. Everyone got acquired for a pretty, pretty high price. Um, and I think the second wave is now uh, in, in Global Ag, right? Where we're seeing a lot of acquisitions um, which are happening again. I think for, for India, uh, it'll take maybe another three, four years before we see a lot more acceptance from corporates. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount the corporates. I think they're moving as fast as they can. Um, they're also stuck between, you know, planning for the season and, and this kind of becomes an ancillary project in the middle of the year where they need to tend to. But I think most of them have now crop dev teams which are focused on at least trying to figure out what they can do together with ag tech companies 
or with ag tech startups right five years ago that was missing um so now i think any large agri business if you reach out to whether it's an itc um you know or, or godridge or this or that everyone from their r and d teams to their sales teams everyone is willing to work with pilot with um agri tech startups i think we need more momentum there um and i think this is again why seeing certain large exits will be important in the sector overall right now where will they come from i think in our understanding um broadly there are two seeing a lot of interest in terms of um you know a lot of european companies or even some bit of american companies looking for tech solutions for small holders because as again like as as in the mentioned i think the kind of uh, tech they have isn't really suitable for not just india but a large part of southeast asia and significant part of uh, significant parts of africa as well right which is kind of the 50% of the world which which now will move up in terms of efficiency in terms of food production and in terms of tech so i think a lot of the the exit i mean whatever we have seen whatever we have structured within uh, omnivore we are seeing enough um, kind of corporates coming in and maybe um, a complete stake sale happen or you know over time uh, they like to acquire a company um, or otherwise there are certain models which can you know attract that large pool of capital private equity or much larger vc which grows at a faster clip and those will probably look at um, you know getting out by an ipo yeah sure. if i may just add one small point sure. here sure. please to what you were uh, on the corporate and technology piece another suggestion suggestion to all the active companies is not to overpromise hmm? to know what they can deliver at that point of time because the decks they come up with at times it's a disappointment and you get to know the actual capabilities on the ground so that's extremely important when you go to a corporate because you are talking to people who have you know decades of experience in food and agri uh, they know the issues very well go to them with what you can do not a what can be done in the very future true. don't be make it an that. investor pitch always <laughs> 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 oh it's it's been a fascinating evening discussing so many issues i think we've covered a lot of ground and uh, the participants there's so much to absorb from what we have discussed and it's almost time if there are any questions which are very specific we haven't been able to take uh, i promise we'll get back to the panelists and get their responses uh, thank you to each of you for taking time off to be on the panel and thanks to everyone who is logged in as participants uh, this is just the beginning and i think uh, we as caspian engage with the sector very deeply uh, if you want to get to know more about us or want to get to know any of the panelists here please reach out to us it will be a pleasure connecting you have a nice evening thank you very much